We're talking about, uh, you know, that 2007 period um, when you've dropped that yep. first mixtape and yep. um, you've ended up on uh, Pegs's Burn City. Yep. And then that was kind of like the introduction to your relationship with Pegs and then you've dropped Long Story Short. Yeah, I mean, that was 2009. But yeah, it's all around the same, same time sort of shit. Now, when you dropped Long Story Short, was that your first release on Obese? Like, did you get signed and then you dropped that album? Yes. Yeah. So, I, until then, I'd done the two mixtapes had been independent. Um, I'd been on Fraser's Clockwork album and, and Pegs' Burn City. They were like the two big feature things that I'd had. And um, Long Story Short came pretty much straight after that. Yeah. Now, when I cast my mind back to that time, yeah, obese was the biggest thing in the country. By far. To get signed to obese at that point in time, I imagine would have been a massive deal. Can you recall like how you felt when you got the, you know, the green light, like you're officially now part of obese, you got a deal. How did that feel for you at that point in time? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a big milestone, bro, a big achievement. Because for the you know five, probably five or so years before that, I'd been a fan of everything that they'd done. They had such clout, you know. Before clout was even a word, they had it. Um, you know, the they'd been home to the biggest acts in the, in the scene were all through obese. You know, every, all of them, other than like uh, other than Lyrical Commission, like everyone else had kind of gone through um, the hoods, you know, B&E, Draft, Funk, or like, I mean, the list just kept going, Muffin Pluto. So it was a huge thing. I was actually there the night that Thunders signed because I was in Sydney with Pegs as his hype man. This is like 2008 when Thunders signed and then being buddies with the Spit Syndicate boys, I was there with them less through coincidence but because it was like they were in melbourne to sign so i was there the night they signed as well and i i signed maybe three or four months after they did so it was really like this new generation and people that i was friends with and people that were coming up around the same time um it was really exciting to be to be officially a part of it and um and, and yeah you know it, it was really like it really felt like that that was the beginning of, of the next sort of phase, which it was, so, yeah. Because uh, I think off that album, you had two singles, Pictures and Generation Y, and they mm -hmm. actually were placed on Triple J, like daytime rotation? Yeah, so Gen, Gen Y um, was the first song of mine that Triple J played. They played uh, my song with Phrase, before that, so they kind of like had an idea of who I was, but yeah, we gave them Gen Y, they played that um, and backed it. But Pictures was the one that they really got around and they really smashed that. And it made it into the Hottest 100 that year. And you know, that was, that was really the first song of mine that sort of springboarded me um, into to being able to do my own tours. You know, we did the Pictures tour in 2009 or 2010. And, um, and, and, you know, that, uh, that support from Triple J combined with being an obese artist really meant, it was a solid foundation to then, you know, kick on from. And like, if you look at it today, if someone gets daytime rotation on Triple J in 2022, it's a big deal with the mm. development of the scene now. Back then, mm. You know, oh wait, your stuff starts getting spun on commercial radio during the day again. Like, do you remember that feeling? How was that for you? Yeah, I mean, again, it was it was sort of two thousand and nine into twenty ten um, is when they really like pictures came out a bit later. So so yeah, it would have been just before twenty ten, I think. Um, I remember it well, bro. It was huge. I mean, making making the hottest one hundred was the real like that was a real moment because they they were triple j were really supporting australian hip-hop um they were playing a lot of different acts but none of them were making it in other than the hoods draft i think maybe muffin pluto 
They were, but they were playing a lot more than the acts that were making the, the Hottest 100. And at that time, the Hottest 100 was massive. It's still a big deal now. It, it kind of it went from there to like sort of mid-2010s. It got to its peak. It's dropped off a little bit now. But it was still a huge deal. And, um, and that was really when it like... It, it, that was a big statement, I feel. And, and again, it, that gave us the... the the leverage to be able to tour because it's like okay there's definitely people all over the country that are fucking with this um let's like put on a tour and hopefully we can like not lose money and um and yeah uh, again it just gives you the the confidence to go out there and, and and see what's up and you didn't win the hottest 100 that year but do you remember what number you got i do i came 66 i, I remember <laughs> I had like a bunch of people at our house. We used to have this crazy share house and um, we had a big party and I was like out the back doing some fucking scallywag shit and um, just hear the whole house start erupting. I'm like, what the fuck is that? And I went in back in there and I was mad because I was like, how the fuck did it only come 66? I was expecting it to be like top 10. I just didn't know what I was talking about. Um, but yeah, I, I've, <laughs> I think that I still got videos on like an old phone of that um, and like, yeah, that was a time. And then I actually went straight from that party to the big day out i think it was one of the last big day outs because phrase was playing and um and he had me jump up and and that was one of the first festival shows i played so it was like that was a crazy day <laughs> it was like uh again it really felt like a sort of statement um out for me anyway so <laughs> The, the, the lesson. Oh, yeah.